Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our last Art and Focus live event of the spring 2022 season. I am Michelle DeMarzo. I'm the Curator of Education and Academic Engagement at the Fairfield University Art Museum. If you have never attended one of our virtual Art and Focus events before, our goal is to just take a few minutes out of our day to look together at a single work of art and to have a conversation which is always a little bit more challenging in the virtual space, but we have a chat box that you can sign in. Any questions, comments, observations that you have or responses to anything that I say, please feel free to share it and we can have a conversation that way. And we will be doing this once again, live and in person in the Bellarmine Hall galleries at Fairfield University next Thursday at 11 a.m. So those of you who would like to come and see this painting in person and have a conversation, we hope that you will stop by. Uh, we will be continuing uh, Art and Focus in the fall, both in person and virtually. And our goal, or what we are planning to do, is to do every event. When we do them at 11 a.m., we'll do it in person. And at noon, we'll do it virtually. So they'll be kind of back-to-back -back experiences. So stay tuned for the listing of what we're going to be featuring this fall at the museum. And without further ado, this is our Art and Focus object for today. This is an oil on board painting by Lawrence Jeep, an American painter. He's based uh, in Arizona, born in 1962. So this is one of the more recent artworks that we have been featuring. Uh, it was painted in 2000, and it has this very quite complicated title, panel number 18 from the last picture show, and then in parentheses, Olympic diver, 1936. We got this last year, as you can see from the accession number, as a gift from the Fleur and B family. And I'll show you a picture of this, of where it is in the museum. It is a reasonably large painting. Uh, you're seeing it installed outside our director's office. And you're seeing the lovely glow of an emergency exit sign at the upper right, and an emergency exit door off to the right. Uh, so you might be wondering why this is not installed somewhere in a more traditional gallery space. Uh, if you know anything about the Fairfield University Art Museum, you may know that although we have only exist existed for 10 years, we are already bursting at the seams with fantastic art objects. We are always, by the way, happy to accept more of museum quality artworks as donations, uh, but we are very small in terms of space and very limited in terms of space. So in fact, many of the paintings in our collection, especially contemporary artworks like this one, are actually in storage. We just don't have the wall space to have them permanently on view. But Jeep's painting, when we got it in person, we saw it for the first time, all of the museum staff were so in love with it that we agreed that we had to find somewhere that this painting could be on view, even if it was in the small hallway outside the director's office where it is facing, I believe, an 18th century English portrait of a countess. So at the very least, we, the museum staff, certainly see this painting every day as we are moving back and forward uh, between our offices. But that's why it is where it is, because we loved it so much, we wanted to make sure it was available and on view. I feel like I've jumped, yeah, I've gone ahead of slide, going back to the main view of the painting. So that gives you a sense of its physical scale um, so it's certainly far from life size, but it's much larger than what I'll show you in a few moments might have been something like its source material. And panel number 18 from the last picture show, Olympic Diver 1936, that last part in parentheses gives us a subject, the diver. Uh, without that context, it would be interesting to think of what we might make of the figure that we're seeing in this painting. For example, you may notice that there is no real background. There's no backdrop. There's this very hazy atmosphere, all shades of brown, of taupe. So not clearly shades of sky, nor clearly any shade indicating water. We don't see a horizon line. There's nothing beneath him, behind him, above him to really give a sense of what he's doing. And of course, I, I've already said Olympic divers in the title, right? So we've already been conditioned to perceive this body of this man moving through space, sort of arcing back toward land or really toward water, but toward the earth in a smoother downward motion. But imagine if that wasn't the title. I mean, he could be suspended in midair. He could be a gymnast instead of a diver, for example. Um, I'm trying to imagine what else his particular costume 
could be interpreted as because you can see he's wearing sort of a singlet. We can see a black, the black fabric wrapping from his upper thigh. He has these two straps that are coming up sort of racer back over his shoulders. So we couldn't say that he's a skier, for example, right? He's dressed for a particular kind of outdoor activity. But the extraordinary and elegant poise of his body sort of captured in this moment, whether it's of descent, of its flight, is just really striking. And I inserted sort of a close-up detail. It's really the next time you're in our galleries, make sure you stop in outside the director's office so you can take a close-up look at the painting because it has one of those uh, extraordinary surfaces that's really fun to spend a few moments just tracing it with your eyes. Unfortunately, my uh, cell phone camera could not do an extraordinarily good job of taking a high-res uh, up-close detail, but the sense of blurriness that you're seeing, for example, in the shadows of the musculature, that is the actual surface of the painting. So it is not painted to be hyper-realist at a very close range. Rather, it's sort of impressionistic. The closer up you get, the more uh, these areas are modeled in such a way that you are very aware that we are seeing patches of color overlaid onto each other. And you might even be able to make out, especially around the curve of his bicep in the sort of little notch of his elbow, you might see this vibrant blue. And that really caught my eye because it made me think of process. It made me think of this painter, Lauren Jeep, maybe starting with this sort of cerulean underlayer, that that might be behind what has emerged as a fairly neutral colored sky or background, if it's not a sky, because it seems to be sort of peeking out around the outlines of the figure. And it's elsewhere in the painting, just peeking out around the contours of this man's body. But this is the closest view that I have to let you see it. So it's, it's things like that that I think can really help you fall into, especially a painting, because with painting, but also with other forms of artwork, let's say sculpture. If you're looking at something, you might be thinking of it in terms of the process of the artist's hand, the unseen hand of the artist. So if you're looking at clay, maybe you're thinking about someone's hands shaping um, that soft material. And when I'm looking at a painting, I am kind of imagining what this artist would have been doing with the hand to lay in these different areas of brushstrokes to build up this depth of color in what is really, if you're looking at that guy's, I'm not an expert on anatomy, trapezius is the word that's coming to mind for this area in his shoulder, but anyone who is um, watching live who is better equipped to identify the musculature of our diving friend, please feel free to drop that as a comment in the chat. But the incredible shadows that are showing you the extraordinary muscular development in his shoulder that's multiple layers of paint building on each other. So it's a pleasure to look at um, close up. It is also a pleasure to look at from a slight remove. Since I've already showed you its physical context in our museum, you may have guessed, and I said that on the opposite wall, there's another painting. You actually can't get too far away from this painting in our current uh, display context, but it's interesting to think about it, seeing it from a distance. So. As with so many objects, um, seeing it in a virtual sense might enable you to have a slightly different experience of it than you would if you walked up to it uh, in the Fairfield University Art Museum. I'm sorry, I'm just, just staring at the, the shadowing and the love, another detail that I really love here, looking at his legs, which are of course almost totally in shadow, right? And we're seeing the back of his legs, you see the highlight falling on one of his upturned soles and there's just that sliver of light coming in just between where his knees are touching, his upper thighs are touching, and then there's that sliver of light, which is just really extraordinary detail. So the title of this painting, or the last part of the title of the painting, uh, Olympic Diver 1936, those of you who are aware of sporting history might remember that the 1936 Olympics took place in Berlin. And the photograph that I'm showing on screen is without a doubt the most iconic event from that Olympics, where of course this is Olympics under Nazi Germany. Uh, that's American athlete Jesse Owens saluting the American flag from atop the winner's podium. He won four gold medals. Uh, his victories as a black man in this um, 
uh, Olympic event in Nazi Germany was heralded as sort of being a rebuke to Hitler's idea of Aryan supremacy. Though we should point out something that Owens himself pointed out about his great victory in the Berlin Olympics is that he returned to the United States where he was still treated as a black man. So he might have been lauded, but he was not, for example, welcomed to the White House by the president as many other Olympic victors were. So as with many things in our history, it's a, it's a fraught history, but this tends to be the moment of those Olympics that we remember most strongly. Uh, it is also one in terms of film history that the Nazi documentary uh, filmmaker Leni Riefenstahl, Riefenstahl, I always pronounce her name a little bit mistakenly, she made a documentary of the Berlin Olympics. Um, and I want to play just a minute of this video with, of course, the um, caveat that, again, Leni Riefenstahl was a supporter of the Nazi regime. She made her films in support of Hitler's vision, but she is also considered to be a important moment in the development of documentary film. So uh, as with many figures with um, politics and opinions that we find repugnant, we also have to think about, do we separate the product of what they have done? Do we not look at it or consider its role in history because of who, what other choices they made as an individual? Uh, and in Riefenstahl's case, her art was uh, completely tied to her ideological point of view. And yet she made many contributions to the development of documentary filmmaking. So one of these is considered to be her diving sequence from her Olympic uh, documentary. As I said, I'm just gonna play a few seconds. I'll start from around 15 seconds. We will drop a link to this into the chat in case anyone would like to watch the entire five minutes. So just giving you a little bit of a sense of Riefenstahl's Olympia diving sequence, what was considered to be so groundbreaking in what she was doing was the way that she used unusual filming angles, the way she did use the slow motion in conjunction with the soundtrack. And as it goes on, it becomes sort of this very choreographed dance-like motion that she has orchestrated out of these film clips. Not all of which, by the way, were filmed live. Some of them, she actually had some athletes recreated after the games were over because she didn't get the shots that she wanted the first time around. But you might be wondering, why am I showing bits of a Nazi documentary filmmaker in the context of our In Focus event, focused on this painting by an American artist painted in 2000, but with this title, Olympic Diver 1936. And it has to do with Lawrence Jeep's uh, painterly practice, where he gets his source material and his goals in making an artwork. And he chooses the subjects for his artwork and I should, by the way, mention, I don't think I had before, the first part of this title, the last picture show was an exhibition that he had in 2000 in a gallery in New York. So he called it the last picture show. This was one of the paintings that was included, but throughout his um, artistic practice, and he's still a working artist, Jeep draws on propaganda images and recreates them, photographs, and recreates them in the medium of paint. So in the case of uh, that, uh, Olympic Diver 1936, the photograph on the left is, I think, uh, the one that he was using as source material. Uh, you'll notice that it has a watermark. Yes, I may have extracted this from, a, from an eBay listing. I have not been able to get a copy of the book that I think it might have come from, which is this one on the right. Uh, Paul Wolf was a really well-known German photographer. He photographed a lot at the games and he published this book that said, you know, what I saw at the Olympics of 1936. And I think that that photograph was one of the several hundred that were included in that publication. But uh, Jeep chooses 
images that are in books. He collects magazines from not just the Nazi regime, but propaganda images from all over the world. And then he transforms them into the subject of his artwork. So if we're looking at the photograph on the left, you can immediately recognize the figure of the diver. We realize that a lot of it has been cropped out. So we'd said looking at it that without any sense of a horizon, for example, you might think that this guy is just sort of doing some sort of ballet move in midair. But the original photograph, as we see, has the edge of the diving board off to the left. We can see the stands with the spectators at the bottom. You see the flags and the pennants at the top of the stands. So in transforming it, he has pulled all of that out. And I've put here a quotation that I found from an, um, an interview with him in 2011. And he explains why he does this, why choose propaganda images and then transform them. And I think it's fascinating, his idea that you can see here is the main idea is to use an image that's ideologically tainted, that comes from artists who are working for the government or were government approved. By reimagining familiar propaganda images as paintings, by making them much larger than the original photos, he says, I tried to re-examine them, forcing old images into viewers' consciousness in new ways, and not so incidentally playing with the tension between photography and painting. People tend to see photos as truth, Jeep says, even though they're manipulated as much as or more than other art forms. If I paint an approved photo, it's no longer approved. That's my game. So I think that's such a fascinating perspective, the idea that an artist like Jeep, by taking a propaganda photograph, transforming it, making it bigger, I'd mentioned that at the outset, the source material, much smaller, if we think it would have fit in a book about that size, that he can, uh, let's say defang it. He can stop it from being able to do its work by transforming it into another medium. And at the same time, especially when viewers of his artwork are conscious of the source material. And I think he definitely wants us to know as an artist where he gets his sources, right? He's not hiding in the title. Olympic Diver in 1936 is giving you a clue to the source material. And most of his, um, most of his titles of his artwork seem to have something that will help you trace it back to the source. So when he says he's forcing a familiar image into your consciousness, he is asking you to sort of grapple with, well, what does it mean for this to have been originally a propaganda photograph from this particular event? Why was Paul Wolf photographing? This is a white man of extraordinary muscular development captured in this moment of power and of grace. In its original context, though, we know that it would have supported a Nazi ideology of the supremacy of the white, quote unquote, Aryan race. He's taken that away from it. So the power of that image to support that ideology, I think Ajip is suggesting, he's robbed it of that by transforming it into another object that can be as much the focus of a painter's brush as the flowers that I have on my table or a bowl of oranges. And when it says he's, he's sort of playing with this power of painting versus photography, I think he's making a, an argument for it, the power of the painter. I mean, a, a painter cannot be as immediate as a photographer. Even if they are on scene, they would need to be making sketches, they would be making drawings, the actual painting would have to come later. Oh, I mean, they could paint on plein air, of course, but they probably would not be able to achieve anything as fast as the photographer. But as he said in his quotation, reminding the viewer that if a painting is fabricated in a very real way, it is constructed by the artist layer by layer, the source material is no different. It was constructed both before the photographer clicked the shutter and afterward. It is constructed in the development process in the studio. We know, I always tell my students, that we are probably more aware now than in times past of exactly how much editing goes into a photo because we all carry a miniature editing studio in our pockets at all times. So we really are aware of all the choices that can be made. Uh, and that has always been true of photography. Black and white photography was, was not more true uh, than the photography that is possible on an iPhone. So I think it's incredible this painting because it doesn't immediately strike you that this is what it's doing. If you don't look at the caption, for example, you can admire it for what it is, this masterful depiction of the human form, the anatomy of this diver, 
you can appreciate the ambiguity that is inherent in the composition without the sense of sky and what we now know of him cropping out the original sort of setting of the photograph. This is a man he's suspended, he's suspended in this moment of perfection, let's say. But once you do look at the title, once you hear from Jeep, and one of the pleasures of dealing with contemporary art is that the artists are still there to answer questions about what they're looking to achieve in their artwork. You can play with these, these two different approaches to it, appreciating it as the painted object, understanding it in the context of what its source material was and what Jeep feels he's able to accomplish by working in this way. I don't know if anyone has any any comments or anything that they see or respond to this painting in looking at it. Um, I would love to see more of Jeep's paintings, so I'm hoping that I get an opportunity. And who knows, perhaps uh, he'll see our, our art in focus and reach out to us, and maybe we could do a show of uh, Jeep's work at the Fairfield University Art Museum. I think that would be extremely extremely interesting. And I think the crossover between sport and art is something that we sometimes we overlook it we don't think that necessarily contemporary artists are thinking about athletics and again it's not just athletics that's drawing jeep to this um, he has done many of these paintings where he's used propaganda images that don't have anything to do with athletics it might be the construction of a of a railroad for example that's being used as propaganda for a particular dictatorship but I do think that it's an interesting crossover, especially we're a university and we have many sports teams. I think that would be something that would draw a lot of interest. And I should also mention, you know, thinking about this idea of forcing people to think about photography, think about its potential value as propaganda, that remains something that is very important in our image saturated world because propaganda is being used on us and around us all the time. And the idea that we certainly teach in art history that to be able to unravel a bit of a visual image is powerful. Visual literacy is powerful. Being able to look at something, a photograph, a painting, and ask, what am I being led toward? And whether the origins of that impulse are you know, a positive goal leading you toward positive thoughts or potentially negative, at least to be able to look at that image and begin to unpack it is a very powerful set of tools in a world like ours when images are being used and repurposed uh, to those means. So I hope if you are um, around and in the area, you will consider joining us next Thursday at 11 a.m. to look at this painting in person. We are, by the way, planning to take it off the wall and move it into the gallery on an easel to make our conversation easier. So we will not be cramming into that uh, little hallway outside the director's office. Uh, but if not, I will hope to see you again in the fall when we restart our virtual Art and Focus events. So I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.